now we will shift to the next speaker, uh, Professor Theo. Please start sharing your screen. Welcome, Charlie. You are muted. You are muted, do you? Okay, so you should, can you hear me now? Yeah. Now it's okay. Okay, well, first of all, my apologies for being late. I'm sorry about that. I just couldn't get sound on my computer. It's good to see you, John. Good to see you, Sam. Uh, and uh, I, I'll get started. We've only got 15 minutes to cover a very large topic. Uh, so this is basically a summation of my uh, algorithm uh, for the treatment of cavernous sinus meningiomas that I've developed over the last uh, 35 years. It, it's a, a difficult tumour and it's difficult to know what to do when someone comes in with a, a lesion in the cavernous sinus. We've been told by our forefathers that you can operate on the cavernous sinus, uh, not with impunity, but certainly uh, with low risk. And I must say that after 35 years, I just haven't found that. Uh, and whenever I've tried to take a meningioma out of the cavernous sinus, I always damage some nerve, some cranial nerve. So uh, this is going to be a very honest appraisal of 35 years. So hopefully others won't make the same mistakes as I've made. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, so if you look at the textbooks, they basically say uh, it's a pretty simple algorithm. If they're asymptomatic, you don't intervene. And if they're symptomatic, you do. Uh, and you can use a combination of surgery, radiosurgery, and radiotherapy. But current algorithms fail to really understand the variable biological behavior of these tumors. Some are incredibly aggressive, but most of them are incredibly benign and indolent. Uh, this is a girl who had radiotherapy for this uh, cavernous sinus meningioma, and she suffered all the consequences of radiotherapy, and she still went blind in the eye. I just can't help but think that maybe if we hadn't intervened, uh, at that early stage, she may have been either in the same situation or maybe even better. Uh, and I see lesions like this. Now this is, I don't even know if this started in the cavernous sinus, but I think it did. Uh, and this patient, believe it or not, he is asymptomatic. Now look at that, it's in every cranial fossa, it's uh, completely uh, filled the cavernous sinus, it's compressed the brain stem, it's filled at the middle cranial fossa, it's gone to the contractual side, and yet this patient is asymptomatic. Uh, and uh, so, you know, if you just looked at that lesion, as I did as a young man, I would have wanted to operate on him for sure. Uh, and here's, here's again, just one example of me trying to take out uh, cavernous sinus meningiomas, like I was told I should, uh, you know, using very meticulous uh, microsurgical technique, uh, and I just, I don't know, I just can't do it. Uh, and there's a beautiful dissection of the intracavernous carotid. Uh, optic nerve is nicely decompressed. Uh, there's the post-op scan showing a complete extirpation of the cavernous sinus meningioma. But unfortunately, that third nerve palsy was permanent. Everything else was fine. She actually had good sensation on her face, but I gave her a third nerve palsy that did not repair. So here's my algorithm. Uh, it's a bit complex looking at it like that. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to break it down and just go through some of these, uh, some of these uh, treatment uh, options. Firstly, if it's asymptomatic, I don't think there's too much controversy when it comes to asymptomatic cavernous sinus meningiomas, and that is no treatment. And just to show you a few examples of patients on whom I have uh, recommended no surgery, and they've been very, very stable for many years. This lady was staved, saw me in 2008. She'd seen another neurosurgeon who recommended a surgery. I said, look, you've got no symptoms. Why don't we just watch it for a while? Yep, and now uh, 25 years later, uh, it's basically the same size and she is still asymptomatic. She thanks me every year for uh, not, have, not allowing her to go ahead with surgery. And then here's just another few examples of very indolent tumors. Uh, yes, they have grown a little bit, but really not much. And they've, uh, I've been following them for many, many years without any symptoms and without any growth. Uh, these ones are growing a little bit more rapidly. Now, that's uh, five millimetres in one year, 2006 to 2007. But believe it or not, that was a growth spurt that then slowed down. And I still haven't operated on that patient, despite the tumour being four, about four times bigger, but still no symptoms. Okay, so let's just leave the asymptomatics alone. Let's now go to the symptomatics. Again, I don't think there's too much controversy when it comes to symptoms from extra cavernous extension. So if you have temporal lobe 
seizures from temporal lobe irritation or visual field defects from anterior extension uh, to uh, strangle the optic nerve, then I think most people would agree that, you know, you try and preserve vision. Don't go into the cavernous sinus, but at least take out the tumour outside the cavernous sinus. And here's a few nice examples of that. This lady's vision was deteriorating, and you can see why. Here's the uh, apex of the uh, orbit, and you can see the tumour in the apex of the orbit on the, uh, on the right side. And here's some intraoperative pictures showing very nicely how the optic nerve is being compromised by a tumor surrounding it. We decompress the optic nerve, we decompress the carotid artery. Her vision is better after surgery, and 13 years later, her tumor is really not that much bigger, and her vision is still stable. So, a small operation, very effective in maintaining vision, and we didn't have to dig into the cavernous sinus and cause any cranial neuropathies. Here's another patient with a much larger lesion extending superiorly posteriorly and anteriorly to the uh, optic nerve. Uh, you can see it's quite extensive. Here's the interoperative video, which I don't think I have too much time to show, but essentially strangling the optic nerve on the ipsilateral side, strangling of the optic nerve on the contralateral side. Have a look at this. Have a look at this now. We sort of look at that. Look at that poor nerve. It's surrounded by a tumor, and you can see the tumor digging into the optic canal. Here's me opening the falciform ligament, burning the tumor. I'm only getting a, a Simpson grade two, but nevertheless, good decompression of both optic nerves. And at the end, uh, good decompression of uh, the entire optico carotid recess. Uh, and uh, this is an aberrant uh, vessel. This is actually the right optic nerve. And uh, and then this is a preoperative MRI scan. And again, I show this video for two reasons. One, to show that we've decompressed the optic nerves nicely, but also to show the versatility of the eyebrow approach. And you can see there's quite a bit of posterior extension of this lesion, a superior extension surrounding the MCA trunk uh, and, and branches. And we get a very good resection all through an eyebrow approach. So there we go, preoperative post-operative, good decompression. Now remember, the eyebrow approach does give you access to the upper one third of the clivus. So you can go retro tubercular, you can go retro uh, dorsum cellar, and you can still take out these tumors using the endoscope as shown beautifully by Takio in the uh, talk to, uh, two talks before me. Uh, here's another one. This patient had seizures, uh, mini terional, good decompression, leave the cavernous sinus alone, uh, and uh, resolution of the uh, uh, seizures. Uh, if you do happen to damage your third nerve or tickle it up, uh, don't be too worried. As long as you leave it intact, of course, then it does recover. And again, some good examples of patients who had immediate third nerve palsies after surgery, but recovered uh, within three months. Unless, of course, it looks like this. This is a cavernous size meningioma, and you can see the third nerve here completely infiltrated by a tumor. And this patient's third nerve, of course, did not get better. Okay, here, let's get into some controversial areas now. What if the patient has pain only, no diplopia, no visual disturbance, but pain in the trigeminal distribution? What do you do? Okay, so I used to operate on these patients. I'd open up the cavernous sinus, I'd let the tumour out, take a bit of tumour out. It did not work. I don't like it. And so I've changed my algorithm. If the pain is manageable by pain uh, clinics, then fine, no surgery, and nothing more than just pain management. If the pain is not managed by pain management, then I don't give surgery, I, I go for radiotherapy. Those of you who know me know how much I dislike radiotherapy, and you've all heard our Matthew talk about this, it does stir up tumors and it, it can turn a, an indolent uh, low-grade meningioma into high-grade, I completely concur with that. But again, after 35 years, me trying to treat pain with surgery just hasn't worked. So uh, you either treat them conservatively with medical uh, management or you go for radiotherapy. Uh, unless, of course, you've given them radiotherapy, the pain, it's failed, they've still got facial pain, then I sort of go, okay, well, there's one other thing I'm willing to try, and that is decompression of the trigeminal nerve in the posterior fossa. So you can see here that the cavernous sinus meningioma is extended posteriorly. Uh, so we go in through a retrosigmoid approach. We take out all of that retrosigmoid or posterior fossa 
meningioma, and she actually did get good pain resolution uh, uh, by doing almost like a genetic procedure where we decompress the trigeminal nerve in its cisternal component. Okay, right here, now let's talk about diplopia. If someone presents with diplopia, no pain, just double vision, I get them to see an ophthalmologist. If the ophthalmologist can manage them with corrective lenses or, uh, uh, or corrective surgery, uh, then of course no treatment. If it's disturbing them and it's unbearable double, vi double vision, they'll usually tell you. And they're the patients that come in and they sort of hide their eye closed or they close their eye. It's almost like a blind eye, essentially. So I do an angiogram on them. If the angiogram shows that the ICA is patent, now listen to this because again, this is contrary to most textbooks. So if the ICA is patent, I, I don't offer them treatment. I don't offer them surgery. I offer them radiotherapy. So let's just go through that again. They present with double vision. It can't be managed with conservative means. It can't be managed by the ophthalmologist. It's unbearable for the patient. I do an angiogram and if the ICA is patent, then I give them radiotherapy. Okay, so let's just summarize that. Therefore, I do not recommend surgery for trigeminal pain that can't be managed medically or diplopia that can't be managed medically in those patients with a patent ICA. Okay, now let's talk about a non-patent ICA. In other words, you do an angiogram and the ICA is occluded. Then, of course, you have other options. You can do curative, exoneration of the cavernous sinus and all the contents, or if they fail radiotherapy, then you can offer that as well. Okay, so just listen carefully again. This is someone who presents with diplopia, it can't be managed with corrective lenses or corrective surgery, they find it unbearable, they come in with their eyes, their eye closed, it's essentially a blind eye. Uh, those patients who have carotid occlusion from their cavernous sinus meningioma, I offer them curative exoneration, extirpation of the tumor from the cavernous sinus, taking everything, all the cranial nerves, uh, including the carotid. Uh, so here's an example of that algorithm in practice. So here's a patient presented in 2005, asymptomatic. Two years later, they have facial pain, so I offer them radiotherapy. Sadly, the radiotherapy fails, and within six months, she's developed diplopia and facial pain, and uh, within a year, she says it's unbearable. Okay, as you can see, her carotid is still patent. So we do an angiogram, her carotid is patent, but she does pass a BTO. And I say, listen, if you pass your BTO, sure, there's only an 87% chance of a stroke, but that means there's a 13% chance of a devastating stroke. I'm not willing to do it. Why don't we just wait until the, uh, the carotid is occluded by the tumor? She says, no, she insists on it. She can't bear the pain any longer. So thankfully, we sack her carotid, we take everything, and you can see I've done a complete resection of the cavernous sinus here, all through a mini terional, and, uh, and here, and uh, her post-op MRI scan looks excellent. All the tumor's gone, so she's had a curative resection. I've taken her carotid. She fits into the 87% who didn't have a stroke, thankfully, and she looks great. She's very happy, she's pain-free, and of course, she's got a blind right eye. Okay, now it becomes a little bit easier, of course, if they've got blindness. If they've got blindness from a complete ptosis or the cranial nerve two, the optic nerve is completely shot, and they've got blindness, then of course, really, you're not treating them for anything because they're blind already anyway. So certainly an option is no treatment at all. You've got a tumor, it's caused blindness, we can't save your vision, so you can just leave it alone if you don't have pain and it's not compromising the vision on the other side. Conversely, if they are worried, or if you are worried, or if in fact they've already got contralateral extension of the tumor and you're worried about the other eye going blind, then certainly you need to do something. Or if they've got pain, you need to do something. Again, I do an angiogram first. If the ICA is occluded, it's simple. They're blind anyway, you take everything, including the carotid, you do a curative resection. What is complicated, of course, is if the ICA is patent, in which case you can wait until the ICA is occluded or you can give them radiotherapy. So again, please note, and again, this is after 35 years of Unfortunately, some bad experiences. Please note that in patients who are blind and want or you want to do a gross total resection, 
and in whom the ICA is patent, I strongly advise them not to have surgery until the ICA is occluded, even if they pass their BTO. Why? Because I've had patients who have stroked out, in other words, that 13% of patients who stroke out, who've passed a BTO when you take their carotid. And I just don't think that's worthwhile. Furthermore, this is what I've done. If patients really want it, or you're worried that it's a malignant or a biologically aggressive meningioma, and you really want to do surgery, then I've sent them to our vascular surgeon. Now, I'm not going to name the vascular surgeon, but he is a fantastic surgeon, technically very skilled, very experienced at ECIC bypass, and every patient I've sent him has done poorly. Now, I don't know why, it's certainly not him because he's a great surgeon. I just can tell you this, that uh, ECDIC bypass is a preoperative measure to take out a cavernous sinus meningioma in my hands has not had good, I've not had good experience. Two of them died uh, and the others have had strokes and other problems and just, just haven't done well. Uh, so in other words, if they are blind in the ipsilateral eye and there is no risk to the contralateral eye, then don't offer an ECIC bypass, don't offer extirpation of the cavernous sinus meningioma, just wait for the carotid to be occluded by the tumor. Okay, and what's this one? Oh, this is just an example of that where we waited, waited, waited. She was blind anyway, and eventually we took it all out and she was fine. So here's my algorithm. Again, it's pretty simple, really. This part's simple. Asymptomatic, wait, no treatment. Symptoms from extra cavernous sinus extension, do extra cavernous surgery. If they've got pain and the pain can't be managed medically, then I offer them radiotherapy. If they've got diplopia and the diplopia can't be managed by an ophthalmologist and it's unbearable, I do an angiogram and see what the situation is and counsel them and consent them according to what the angiogram shows, warning them of the risk of a stroke if we go ahead and occlude the carotid with surgery, even though they pass their BTO, there's still that risk of stroke. The only exception to all these rules are the aggressive ones, the biologically aggressive ones. And I must say that these, you just have to treat uh, uh, each of them individually because they really are a difficult uh, tumor to treat. Because essentially they come into you and they can still see, but you know that the situation's bad, you know that it's malignant and it's gonna uh, start spreading badly. So you're gonna be offering them, offering them surgery that's gonna blind them. And that's a really hard decision for them to make when they come in with vision. So here we go. This is a situation, 47 year old female. She had double vision. She had deteriorating vision, but she certainly wasn't blind. So my first operation was exactly according to my algorithm. And that is extra cavernous subtotal resection to de decompress the uh, optic nerve. Eye round incision. You can see really good decompression of the optic nerve. Here's the carotid. And of course she did very, very well. Here's a preoperative axial. Post of axial, you can see all the tumors left in the cavernous sinus, but the other stuff's gone. And here's the preoperative coronal and postoperative coronal showing a very good resection of all the extra cavernous stuff. Six weeks after surgery, she was still uh, uh, had a complete ptosis, but three months after surgery, she was looking great. I thought that she was going to behave like the majority of cavernous sinus meningiomas and just go for many, many years without any progression clinically or radiologically. Sadly, this is what happened. She had a very early recurrence, and look at this. Bad extension uh, of the tumor uh, in all different planes uh, and uh, worsening of her third nerve where she got a complete ptosis again. So we know this is a biologically aggressive tumor. Uh, they called it a grade two. It was really acting like a grade three. Uh, so I offered her curative extirpation of her entire cavernous sinus. And you can see that we've done it through an eyebrow incision. Here's a mini craniotomy. Here's a post-op uh, incision. And you can see I've taken her entire cavernous sinus, her entire tent. Uh, everything's gone. Her carotid's gone. And she did actually have some ischemia for a while uh, and poor circulation for a while. Thankfully, with time, she recovered. She never had a completed stroke. Uh, and this is her looking good apart from a complete third nerve palsy, which... Again, she was happy to accept because she had it before surgery uh, and she was going rapidly blind and she knew that this tumor was an aggressive tumor. 
So I'd like to conclude by saying the treatment algorithm for cavernous sinus meningiomas is complex. It's not as simple as the textbooks would have you believe. And really you should tailor, each, uh, tailor the treatment to each individual. Treatment decisions should take into consideration the indolent nature of these tumors. And please, I hope I've impressed upon you that I've had, I've been around long enough to see these tumors just sit there and not grow or just grow very, very slowly. And you really don't have to do much for the majority of these patients. Unlike what I normally say when I give these lectures, I normally try and steer clear of radiotherapy, but in here I think radiotherapy plays a very definitive role in treating pain uh, in patients who don't have diplopia, uh, who have an ICA that's patent. Uh, they may or may not have passed the BTO, but patients who have pain, I think they do pretty well with radiotherapy and not surgery. Definitive gross total resection and exoneration of the cavernous sinus should be reserved for those with ipsilateral blindness and occluded ICA. Now, sure, you're probably sitting there going, well, hang on, most of these don't have an occluded ICA. They have a very compromised ICA uh, and they pass a BTO. And I think that's fine to have that conversation. But again, you will get burnt, I'm sorry. You know, the textbooks call it 13% of patients who pass their BTO will still have a stroke. And, and uh, sadly, uh, practically, I've seen that in my 35 years. So as long as patients are willing to accept that, sure, they pass their BTO, you need to do a gross total resection, then I think that's fine, but, that, but I'd rather than wait until the tumor takes out the, uh, takes out the uh, carotid. Preoperative EC to IC bypass should be considered in even fewer patients because of the negative experience I've had over the years with this operation. Uh, and this algorithm applies the majority of grade one meningiomas and should be modified for more biologically aggressive lesions. Thank you very much. And again, in these times of conflict uh, and where brothers are fighting brothers, I think we should try and be leaders in our communities and try and uh, push for peace amongst our brothers. This is a great saying by Confucius, and that is within the four seas, all men are brothers. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, also to you for uh, this excellent presentation. And we have uh, one question uh, in chat box asking about it, uh, is radiotherapy prevent growth or recurrence? So is radiotherapy, so what is the game? What's the question? Is radiotherapy? Prevent growth or recurrence? Uh... Well, uh... Look, I would rather, so if a patient has a complete extirpation of their cavernous sinus and it still recurs, in other words, like those patients, you do a post-op scan, you can't see any tumor, but it's a biologically aggressive tumor, grade three, and you see recurrence, absolutely, there's a role for radiotherapy, absolutely. Look, I just, look, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit of a disciple of our MEFTI when it comes to meningiomas of the cavernous sinus. Uh, I think if you give radiotherapy too quickly, and too early and don't think about surgery and other options. I, I think there is that group of patients that he talks about and he shows in his talks that uh, it, it's not good. It, it, it turns them nasty, you get mutations, you get point mutations, you get cytogenetic aberrations from radiotherapy and, and it can turn a grade one into a grade three. And, and I strongly believe that. So, you know, it, it has its role, but please, it has a limited role when it comes to either upfront meningiomas or recurrent meningiomas. Thank you, Professor Tuyo. Is there any question?